Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Cartmill, and I want to welcome you all on this webcast of the eighth iteration of the BU Dialogues in Biological Anthropology. This afternoon, we're going to be dealing with a very special and very important set of fossils that were discovered in Ethiopia in 1994, and that the describers and, and discoverers of these fossils have proclaimed and analyzed as really transformative and revolutionary finds, finds that have, have in a lot of ways erased what people thought about uh, the earlier stages of human evolution in the early 20th century, and uh, uh, the second half of the 20th century, and gone back to the earlier part. During the first half of the 20th century, there was a general consensus among people who studied human evolution and our relationship to the other primates that Human beings never went through a long-armed, ape-like, arm-swinging or brachiating phase in our evolution. That the human lineage had come off quite early, some people said all the way back in the Oligocene, uh, when uh, the ape ancestry was still largely quadrupedal. And the argument was that if human beings had become long-armed, long-handed, arm-swinging, ape-like animals, that that would have shunted us into a very specialized kind of locomotor adaptation from which our ancestors would never have been able to escape uh, into, a, into a bipedal kind of short-armed adaptation when they came to the ground. All of this changed uh, in the late 1950s and early 1960s with the advent of what was called the new physical anthropology. Uh, and during this phase, the received wisdom switched over to a very different kind, to the opposite kind of, of assertion, of claim, that in fact the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees had been very much like a, a living chimpanzee, uh, with a few minor differences, both in its uh, ecology, its locomotor behavior, and probably in its social organization. The discovery of the Artipithecus ramidus fossils and the uh, Artipithecus uh, 500 skeleton from Aramis in Ethiopia in 1994 uh, changed all that in the eyes of its discoverers. And in 2009, uh, they let the rest of the world know about it and through an entire issue of science devoted to this fossil and other uh, fossils of the same animal recovered from the same general area. Their analysis concluded that the Artipithecus fossils showed that human beings had, in fact, never passed through an ape-like phase in our, in our evolutionary career, that the last common ancestor of human beings and chimpanzees had been a quadrupedal animal that moved around in a rather monkey-like fashion in the trees, and that the immediate ancestors of our own bipedal kind of animal, beginning with the Australopithecus material uh, from eastern and southern Africa in the Pliocene and Pleistocene, uh, the immediate ancestors of those bipedal apes had been animals that were not arm swingers, that were clambering quadrupeds in the trees and upright bipeds on the ground, and that the best example of that was the Artipithecus ramidus material. So today we've brought here uh, two very distinguished senior scientists, uh, primary uh, world-renowned experts on uh, human evolution and the morphology of human fossils uh, to talk about their changing perceptions of Artipithecus and what kind of effect the Artipithecus discoveries have had on their overall interpretation of the early phases of human evolution. So I'd like to begin our discussion by uh, uh, handing over the, uh, the podium uh, to Professor William Kimball, who is the director of the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, who will tell us about the Artipithecus finds, place them in their phylogenetic and uh, evolutionary context, and then go on to tell us about the skull of Artipithecus and its dentition, and what sort of difference that makes for our understanding of early human evolution. Bill? Thank you very much, Matt, and I appreciate the invitation to uh, participate in these BU Dialogues in Anthropology with my good friend and colleague, Bill Jungers. And the essential message that I will bring today is that with respect to Artipithecus ramidus, despite its amazing and in some senses unanticipated constellation of anatomical features, it is a species that is indeed more closely related to us than it is to a, to a chimpanzee and that the cranial base, the base of the skull, constitutes some of the strongest evidence 
uh, for this conclusion. The work that I'm going to talk about today stems from a collaboration I've begun with colleagues Dr. Gensua, Tim White, uh, Yoel Rack, and Berhani Asfau, and uh, leverages work that was done in the early 1990s uh, by this group on some of the first discoveries of Artipithecus that became the holotype specimen, the type specimen of the species. To set the context, this is a phylogeny of African hominoids showing the relationship between gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. The key question we want to ask about uh, this phylogeny, in particular, the point at which the chimpanzee and human lineages diverged, is what changed there? We are a lot of uh, characteristics, a long catalog of characteristics in which humans are different from chimps and other African apes. And the, the one question we want to know is, from upright posture all the way to lithic technology and sophisticated communication, when did these characteristics change? When, where, and how did we become unique? In order to answer that question, we must rely on the fossil record. And it was only within the past 20 years or so that the fossil record of human evolution became uh, populated by fossil assemblages that bear on the time when we last shared an ancestor with the chimpanzee between six and eight million years ago. Before that time, our earliest representatives were Lucy and other early Australopithecus species that took us back only three to three and a half million years ago. And so these fossils that have been found fairly recently fill a tremendous gap in the time scale of our evolution and hence in our understanding of it. The best known from the point of view of skeletal evidence is, of course, Artipithecus ramidus. This is a species that was found by Dr. Tim White's team in the middle Awash research area of the Ethiopian Rift Valley and has, as Matt suggested, really turned on its head some of our preconceptions about the earliest phases of human evolution. Artipithecus ramidus raises a number of key questions, the first of which is, is it in fact more related, more closely related to us than it is to a chimpanzee or other apes? The second is, if it is in fact more closely related to us, how? Is it a linear ancestor of later humans, or is it a side or parallel branch? And the third is, to the extent that Artipithecus ramidus departs from the anatomy of humans and our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, what does it say about the expected anatomy in the last common ancestor of chimps and humans? I can't address all those questions today, and my colleague and friend Bill Jungers will do so. I'm going to focus on the first one, and principally from the point of view of the skull. The best preserved specimen of Artipithecus ramidus, and this is a generous description because at its finding it was in terrible shape and required a great deal of effort to clean and reconstruct and understand, is the specimen ARAVP6-500, which is a partial skeleton that includes teeth, part of a lower jaw, and crushed, very badly crushed elements of the skull. The first inferences as to the human-like uh, status of Artipithecus came from one of the specimens that was found early on in the study of Artipithecus, ARVP 1-500, which is an undistorted skull base uh, consisting of two components of the temporal and occipital bones. Most of the inferences that I'll be talking about today come from this specimen. But in addition, there are characteristics of the canine teeth, a set of characteristics that also support the idea of a human relative status for Artipithecus that I will briefly review as well. Now, this is an image that shows the reconstructed skull of the uh, 6-500 skeleton juxtaposed with the temporal and occipital bones from the undistorted specimen from the year before, the 1-500 specimen. And this is a, a reconstruction done by Gen Sua using scanned digital images and published by him and his colleagues in the journal Science in 2009. And here it's compared with the skull of a chimpanzee and a human. Right off the bat, and in a very superficial, almost gestalt sense, we can see that the skull of Artipithecus is indeed very ape-like in a generic sense. A very tiny brain, first of all, of only about 300 cubic centimeters, 
actually smaller by a little bit than the average for chimps, certainly much smaller than what we see in humans, and hence the brain case is very, long, is very low and small, coupled to a face that indeed has an ape-like aspect to it. You can see that the face, the maxilla, and the snout project downward and outward from the, uh, from the brain case. But as I will now show, these are superficial similarities that belie some other interesting differences that in part, uh, in comparison to chimpanzees, can be tied to uh, the canine teeth. So here we see the, uh, the canines of a chimpanzee, a uh, male individual, and is well known, even in very adult, uh, very advanced stages of wear, old adults, the chimpanzees and uh, the canines and chimpanzees are long and interlocking teeth. And of course, this relates to their lifetime of sharpening and honing in a polygynous social system. When we move to humans, naturally, we see that as, the ind as individuals grow, the canines wear down from their tips so that their wear planes are essentially in line with those of all the other teeth. Now, down below here, uh, from Gensua's article in, uh, in Science on the dentition of Artipithecus, we can see six upper canines of Artipithecus in different stages of wear, from barely worn, a relatively young individual, all the way to a very old individual. And you can see, as you move from left to right, the wear on those canines is principally from the tip. That is, as the individuals are growing older, they are wearing their canines more like humans than they are like apes. This, it seems to me, as and supporting the work of Sua and others, uh, is one sign of a close phylogenetic relationship between Artipithecus and humans to the exclusion of chimpanzees and other apes. Now, if we move to the cranium itself, this is a superimposed uh, uh, image of the Artipithecus cranium on that of a chimpanzee. And in comparison of the two, you can see that unlike the chimpanzee with its tremendous projection of the snout beneath the nose and relatively deep face, the face of Artipithecus, despite its prognathism, is actually less projecting and less vertically deep than in an African ape. One of the other differences relates to the position of the occipital condyle, which is where the cervical vertebral column articulates with the base of the skull. And in Artipithecus, the occipital condyle sits almost right underneath the auditory opening, the external auditory meatus. Whereas in chimpanzees, the occipital condyle is in a much more posterior or rearward position. And we'll return to this in a little bit. One of the other differences relates to the area where the chewing muscles, the temporalis on the brain case, intersect with the neck muscles that support the head on the cervical vertebral column. And in humans and all other hominins, including Australopithecus, that junction is relatively low and horizontal on the back of the skull. If we move Artie aside and take a look at a chimpanzee, we can see that that junction is much more steeply angled because chimpanzees, being primarily quadrupeds, have that head slung out in front of a relatively horizontal cervical vertebral column, and the neck muscles reach way up on the back of the skull uh, to support it. A very pronounced difference between Artipithecus and uh, a chimpanzee. In this image, we see a bisect bisected images of a chimpanzee skull on the left and Artipithecus ramidus on the right. There are two key differences I'll draw your attention to. One is the extremely pronounced and high superorbital torus of the chimpanzee, which Artipithecus lacks. In chimps and gorillas, uniquely among the hominoids, you get this tremendous development of the superorbital torus that tends to obscure the brain case in facial view, not in Arti. Similarly, look at the great depth of the maxilla in chimpanzees as uh, this, this whole snout area is, uh, is quite a bit more extensive than in Artipithecus. To some extent, this traces to the very large size of the canines and canine roots in chimpanzee in contrast to the relatively diminutive canines and their roots in Artipithecus. On the other hand, we can look at the very undeveloped uh, infraorbital plate. This is the area of the zygomatic bone and maxilla right beneath the orbit, which is quite shallow in chimpanzees 
similarly shallow in Artipithecus. So this is a, a primitive ape-like retention in the Artipithecus face, and that's reinforced by the fact that both in Artipithecus and in chimpanzees and other African hominoids, the zygomatic arch, which carries the masseter, the other major chewing muscle, out alongside the brain case, is tucked in. It's not a flaring arch, as we see in some later uh, hominins, such as Australopithecus afarensis. And here we see two differences between Artipithecus and early Australopithecus, one of them being the tremendous depth of the infraorbital region beneath the, uh, beneath the orbit here in Australopithecus compared to Artipithecus, and note the great flare of the zygomatic out around the side of the brain case compared to the narrow, tucked-in zygomatic of Artipithecus. These changes most likely reflect, in Australopithecus, early steps toward specialization of the chewing apparatus, which is distinctive of this entire grade of, of early hominins and is not present in Artipithecus. Now, most of the inferences on the cranial bases I mentioned come from this specimen found in 1993. It's one of the holotype, the holotype specimen of Artipithecus ramidus, uh, ARAVP1-500. Two pieces of the cranial base. There is the midline present on the basi-occipital component, so we have good control over the position of bilateral landmarks. This was the specimen on which the first inferences were made by Tim White's team back in 1994 on a relatively short cranial base with an anterior foramen magnum and occipital condyle. We have taken that initial analysis, have examined it, and moved forward. And the results I'll now share with you, in my opinion, make the cranial base of Artipithecus even more similar to, to you and me uh, as compared to a chimpanzee. Here we see the uh, anterior point on the foramen magnum. And here we see the two openings of the uh, carotid canals on the cranial base. And it is generally true in, in humans and other hominins, these landmarks align in very similar coronal plane. Okay? So that's where we're going to start, and we'll take the analysis one step further. Now, in this slide, we have images, drawings of a gorilla skull on the left and a human skull on the right. You can see very clearly the difference in the position of the frame and magnum on the skull base, it being relatively posterior or rearward in the gorilla, much further forward on the skull base in the humans. We can render this difference graphically using rectangles and anchor the rectangles on the anterior point of the foramen magnum, called basion, and then run that rectangle forward to these uh, holes here called the foramina ovale, which is passage for one of the cranial nerves here. And you'll note that in comparison to humans, in apes, that, that rectangle is, it describes a square almost, equal on all sides. Whereas in humans, the foramen magnum has moved forward in essence, spreading out these neurovascular canals uh, in, all along the cranial base, and the rectangle is indeed elongated and short from front to back. The fact that the human cranial base is so short should not come as a big surprise to us when we look at data expressing the length of the cranial base in great apes shown here from uh, gorillas on down to bonobos or pygmy chimpanzees, all of which basically have a cranial base length expected for their skull size, as expressed here by the breadth between the outer margins of the orbits, the so-called biorbital breadth. Australopithecus already shows a human-like shortening of the cranial base, according to these data, with two specimens of Australopithecus afarensis from Hadar falling well below the main cluster of apes seen above. The question is, how does Artipithecus fall into this relationship. Well, we don't have the breadth between the orbits on the 1 slash 500 skull, but we can start with our rectangle. And if we use the anterior point on the foramen magnum as our anchor point, and some of the other landmarks preserved or projected uh, onto, the, onto the base, we can see that as in humans, the rectangle is wide and short in contrast to the elongated uh, more square shape of the rectangle 
in, uh, in, in the great apes. So that's one indication that not only is the cranial base short, but it's also wide in Ardipithecus as in humans. And here are some metrical data to support this conclusion. We had to go into, um, to, to, to get these data, we had to make some estimates of cranial base length. Uh, I can certainly go into those in, in, in more detail in a, in a question period. We don't have time to go into it today. But here are a range of estimates of, uh, of cranial base length showing in relation to a different skull size surrogate, the width between the auditory canals, showing that Ardipithecus ramidus falls with humans in having a relatively short cranial base compared to uh, the great apes. And if we put now an estimate of cranial base, or an actual measure of cranial base width into our equation, we can see that Ardipithecus indeed in both length and width falls in with modern humans. Great apes with their long, narrow bases, humans with their short, wide bases, Here's a couple of Australopithecus skulls and Ardipithecus falling with those. Now, there have been two main explanations for these kinds of changes in the cranial base in human evolution. One of them posits that the foramen magnum moved forward and the cranial base got short when humans stood up and the vertebral column, the cervical vertebral column, moved forward on the skull base in consequences as a comparison to, uh, to the situation uh, in, in the quadrupedal uh, great apes. And so when we look at skulls in cross-section, we can see, for example, that the cervical vertebral column exits or articulates with the back part of the cranium in the gorilla and other apes. In humans, on the other hand, it is much more centrally located, as we've seen, and descends vertically. The question is, is this a locomotor change? However, it's not the only change that occurs in the um, in the skull uh, and, and in the skull of these, of these apes. Another difference has to do with brain size. So for example, the human brain is many times larger that, than that of an ape, and the most efficient way to pack increased volume in a given space is as a sphere, and the notion that uh, over time, the more spherical enlarged brain of humans essentially altered the shape of the back of the brain bringing the foramen magnum forward on the skull base uh, in humans. So the question is, what is responsible for these changes? Is it bipedality or is it brain size? I would suggest that given the 300 cubic centimeter uh, brain size of Ardipithecus, locomotion is probably a more likely uh, functional tie to some of these cranial base uh, changes, speaking for myself. What Ardipithecus shows us, however, that bipedality, as my colleague will discuss, was an early change uh, shortly after the, the split of the chimpanzee and human uh, lineages. That cranial base structure, such as the position of the foramen magnum, if it is indeed tied to locomotion, as I would think, possibly reinforces the notion that Ardipithecus was an orthograde biped, and early change in canine structure uh, as well, which is probably tied to social structure. With Australopithecus, we get a shift to more obligate terrestrial bipedality, and also, possibly related to that, a specialization, specialization in the masticatory system, which we already see developed in, in, in Lucy and other Australopithecus. And then, of course, it's not until the origin of Homo, the elaboration of, of our own genus and its lineage, we see an increase in cognitive ability, possibly tied to more sophisticated uh, lithic technologies as a mean, means of dealing with uh, resource utilization. So in conclusion, Ardipithecus cranial base structure ties that species to us. It is an unusual creature, as you'll hear more about in a minute, to be sure, but its cranial base structure speaks unequivocally, in my view, to a tie to the human species. And that structure, therefore, in the central cranial base has been with us for at least four million years. And in my view, it is more likely to be related to body posture and locomotion than to brain size, given the very tiny brain 
of Artipithecus. I thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. That was uh, very forceful and very persuasive. And uh, your conclusion, which is that the cranial shape of and the cranial based proportions of Artipithecus are giving us a oblique signal of bipedality, of bipedal upright posture and locomotion in this animal leads us very nicely into our next speaker, uh, Professor William Jungers, who is the chair of the Department of Anatomical Sciences at Stony Brook University, uh, a, a long time and well recognized authority and expert on the evolution and anatomy of the postcranial skeleton, who is going to come up here and tell us about how the Artipithecus material transformed his own perception of what human evolution was like. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for your hospitality and for the opportunity to participate in your dialogue series on a subject that's become very near and dear to me over the last few years. As you'll soon see, a dialogue of sorts about Artipithecus has been going on inside my own head for some time now, and my thinking has evolved and continues to evolve as I learn more. I also find myself uh, today to be in the awkward position of being in almost total agreement with my friend and colleague, Bill Kimball. I guess it had to happen eventually by chance alone. Here's a much simplified roster of human relatives and possible ancestors through time, uh, not unlike the one that Bill showed, uh, but without any attempts to connect the dots. I would draw your attention to the extinct species in the red oval seen over here in the lower right. These are what I would argue are the best candidates for the earliest members of our lineage or hominid clade, but some skeptics might argue that they are really more pretenders than contenders. Ironically, other experts would argue that they are indeed hominins and probably belong uh, in the same genus. As someone interested primarily in the evolution and functional anatomy of the postcranial skeleton, I've despaired over the complete lack of published postcrania in the case of Salhalanthropus, and by the very scrappy skeletal record of the other two genera, Auroran and, and, uh, and Artipithecus. Now, if bipedalism is a defining land hallmark, perhaps the hallmark of our clade, then the collection of fragmentary fossils before 2009 was suggestive, if not exactly definitive. Fence sitting seemed a reasonable wait and see position under these circumstances, and wait we all did. That changed rather dramatically in 2009 when Artipithecus rambidus exploded across the pages of science, all 377 pages. And I'm still trying to digest all the information presented by White, Lovejoy, and Sua, and many others in this one giant bolus. Suddenly, we had a treasure trove of postcranials, including the incredible skeleton seen on the cover, ARA VP6-500. Some prominent scientists, like Alan Walker, proclaimed Artipithecus to be the most important fossil hominin ever discovered. And Artie was everywhere on the cover of magazines, on television shows, and all over the web. But as her discoverers and describers noted, here was a hominid unlike anything we'd ever seen before, a marvelous mosaic of primitive and derived features, a combination that probably no one would have ever predicted. It was an animal that was a terrestrial biped, but just as comfortable in the trees. It had solved the arboreal terrestrial problem in a manner decidedly unlike chimpanzees. If anything, it was the anti-chimp, and the fossil record was again playing trickster. As a postcranial person, I was stunned by the bounty of elements rarely seen in early hominids, especially the hand and foot bones. There had been some earlier hints that Artie's postcranial skeleton was full of surprises. For example, Tim Wyatt is said to have quipped if you wanted to find something that moved like these things, you'd have to go to the bar scene in Star Wars. That's provocative, intriguing, but not very helpful. Of course, even with this new mountain of evidence, not everyone was convinced that Artie belonged to our family tree. 
A couple of brief exchanges appeared in science. Some folks felt chimpanzees had been disparaged. And in 2011, this critique appeared in Nature by Wood and Harrison. My two-word summary of their cautionary take-home message is shown here in red. Beware homoplasy. In other words, perhaps some of the features heralded as hominine were not due to shared heritage after all, but were merely convergences or parallelisms that could be observed elsewhere in the fossil record and would therefore not serve as a ticket into the hominine club. They presented the late Miocene insular fossil ape from Italy, Oreopithecus, seen over here, as a prime example. And they placed Artie, Aurorin, and Sahelanthropus in this provisional hominoid taxonomy as inserte cetus, of uncertain placement, but notably outside of other hominins. I personally think that Oreopithecus is something of a red herring in this debate, and I'd be happy to expand upon that if anyone is interested. But there were also other skeptics, including this guy, Jungers, who in 2009 said, this is a fascinating skeleton, but based on what they present, the evidence for bipedality is limited at best. He went on elsewhere to say that we have to abandon bipedality as a hallmark of being a hominine since it's stricto if we hope to keep Artie in our clade. If we had just found the fossils below the neck, it's possible we wouldn't be talking about Artie as a hominine at all. Ah, if we could turn back time. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to invite you to join me as I feast upon some crow I cooked up for myself back then. Today, I'd like to defend the following propositions, that Ardipithecus was a facultative biped, comfortable on the ground and in the trees, that Ardipithecus raminus probably really was an early hominin, and that arbor and despite these two factors, Ardipithecus was still a versatile arborea, arborealist. So what changed my mind? What precipitated this conversion experience? Well, for starters, Tim White made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He invited me to study the Artie fossils at the National Museum of Ethiopia after looking at high resolution casts in his lab in Berkeley in 2010. He allowed me to assemble an ex a team of experts on the hands and feet, seen here with Tim and Dr. Bahani Asfa uh, back at the museum in 2011. I've dubbed this group Team Chiridia because of their expertise in hands and feet, and it includes some very, very uh, well-informed young investigators, Matt Tocheri at the Smithsonian, Kaylee Orr, Sergio Almathia, and Biren Patel. We were allowed to study everything in Addis, and Ginsua provided access to invaluable micro-CT images for our 3D analyses. Dr. Kimball also kindly allowed us to study new fossils of Australopithecus afarensis that were unpublished at the time. Acquiring and analyzing 3D models of bones is hard work and time consuming. We're still in the midst of data collection from laser scanning and CT scanning, so our results to date are preliminary and best seen as a progress report. And our bias remains, it's best to quantify everything you possibly can. So now let me offer three lines of evidence that convinced me that Artie was indeed a biped, a facultative biped that was at home on the ground and in the trees. Here you see the foot of Artipithecus to the left. This is from the sole or planter view. Other views can be seen in smaller frames uh, down below. The feature that really jumps out is the divergent hallux, or big toe. It's a mobile grasping organ that is well suited for locomotion into and within the trees. In other words, it's not adducted and in line with the other toes as in humans and other early bipedal hominins. The lateral toe bones including the proximal phalanges, uh, are also pretty long and quite curved. And at first I couldn't get past this grasping complex to see the bipedal signature. But let me draw your attention to the upper right panel. What you see here is the third metatarsal of a human, of a chimpanzee, and another individual of Artipithecus that preserves all the anatomy of this bone. The shaft of the human in Artipithecus is quite straight, it's more curved than the chimpanzee. But I want to point out especially this little bump right here. This is known as the dorsal dome. This dorsal doming reflects 
an extension of the articular surface for the base of the phalanx to ride up onto the dome during the extreme extension that occurs during the push off of walking. The bases of the phalanges that articulate with the dome were also angled or dorsally canted to facilitate this toe off movement. We agree with Lovejoy and colleagues that this joint complex is derived and occurs only in bipeds. It's been a difficult feature to try to quantify though. And we think we've come across a, a promising method called 3D geometric morphometrics for this purpose. Using th uh, XYZ coordinate data and a method called Procrusty superimposition, uh, you can now see a mesh of points that are derived from these landmarks that are superimposed over the articular dome itself. And what we've done is summarized the information uh, in this kind of analysis in sort of two primary axes of variation. And, and what you see here is a group of apes and monkeys separated completely from modern humans. And we believe that this 3D shape information is really being driven by the doming. And we fully expect Artipithecus to fall into this human envelope when it's included along with other extinct hominins. The second anatomical complex, oh, excuse me. The same doming canting complex has been used recently to identify a 3.5 million year old partial foot from Bertelli in Ethiopia. This was a previously unknown bipedal hominin with morphological affinities to Artie's foot. It's been superimposed on a silhouette of a gorilla foot here. This shows the same complex, dorsal doming and, and, uh, uh, and canting. And uh, it's, it is very, very different than its contemporary Australopithecus afarensis. It suggests that Artipithecus-like trans adaptation for both arboreality and terrestrial bipedality was not even necessarily transitional, but instead a long-lived and very successful evolutionary strategy that persisted in Ethiopia. We we're also trying to characterize the shape of individual foot bones, like the talus seen here, that bone that connects the rest of the foot to your leg at the ankle. Using methods developed by Matt Tocheri and Kaylee Orr, we've segmented out articular versus non-articular parts of the bone and calculated angles between joint surfaces and degrees of curvature of these surfaces. Artie's talus is seen up here in the black box. A gorilla talus is shown over here to the right, showing you in different colors how the, the different surfaces have been segmented out. Now, in combination, all these features uh, allow one to discriminate quite clearly among different species, here indicated by different polygons. Here are humans over here, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and some Miocene apes called proconsul, and baboons are, are over here. Uh, Already is seen right here in the middle, in the pri one primary axis overlapping with this group that's fairly arboreal to be sure, uh, but along the second axis it's moved down towards humans uh, and gorillas. So it's in an intermediate shape space that is shared by a lot of other fossil hominins that we all agree are bipedal. And if you were to lump all the other fossils into a group as a separate category, and then classify already by itself, it is classified as an early hominid and not like anything else. Now eventually, we hope to put this information from all the individual bones of the foot back into an integrated whole. There we go. The second anatomical complex that indicates bipedality is the mosaic anatomy of the bony pelvis. Yes, this bone is badly crushed and it's required extensive reconstruction. Tim White jokingly refers to this as the Irish stew. But I can confirm that informative parts are indeed intact and require no reconstruction, including the lower half of the iliac blade. The area between the hip joint and the sacroiliac joint seen between these two red horizontal lines. This is also known as lower iliac height. As in humans and later fossil hominins, this distance is very short and arty. 
and indicates that the center of gravity has been re relocated closer to the hip joint in a more stable position for a biped. Again, we see a mosaic anatomy. Here's Artipithecus compared to, to Lucy, a modern human, and a chimpanzee. There are other features that, are, that hint at a hominine-like morphology, including the incipient sciatic notch. It's as if we had a hominine false pelvis grafted onto a more primitive, ape-like, true pelvis. In addition, if this is now showing Artie in gray, superimposed on the pelvis of Lucy. If this reconstruction is also accurate, it actually is surprising because it actually, it places the lesser gluteal muscles, those muscles used in lateral balance, in a more favorable position than even we see in Lucy. The third and final feature of the skeleton that I believe signals bipedality isn't even part of the postcranium. It's the anterior position of the foramen magnum that Dr. Kimball talked about so eloquently earlier. This new study by Rousseau and Kirk provides independent and I believe persuasive evidence for not just orthograde or erect posture in Artie, but for bipedalism specifically. They examined bipedal and quadrupedal marsupials and rodents in addition to primates and discovered a predictable relationship that to them suggests that foramen magnum position may be used to identify bipedal adapt adaptations in fossil hominids. Accordingly, the anteriorly positioned foramen magna of Salanthropus and Artipithecus compared with extant hominoids provides strong evidence that both fossil genera were indeed habitually bipedal. Artie, along with Salanthropus, was described as a cladistic hominine even before 2009, a finding I conveniently forgot about in my earlier skeptical remarks. This phylogenetic study by Strait and my Stony Brook colleague, Fred Grine, had used cranial dental characters to place Artie firmly within a monophyletic clade of hominids back in 2004. The derived features seen in the postcranium of Artie linked to bipedalism would only serve to strengthen this phylogenetic hypothesis. The addition of primitive characters really would not matter. Now, so in other words, here's Artie nested between Australopithecus anamensis and Sahelanthropus. This does, this kind of analysis doesn't tell us if Artipithecus is ancestral to anything else, but it does suggest it's a hominy. The re reassembled hand of Artipithecus is also fascinating. Many aspects of its morphology are similar to the same bones in Australopithecines, including some of the wrist bones, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. It's a powerful grasping organ, but it's not especially long. It's well suited for gra grasping in a variety of arboreal activities, but it is not the elongated hand of a specialized suspensory ape like the gibbon, chimpanzee, or orangutan. It's also not the specialized hand of a knuckle walker, nor is it the specialized hand of a digitigrade quadruped or of a palmigrade quadruped for that matter. <laughs> this is a, a slide that has, has a lot of information, but I just want to point out two things. This is, this, these are schematics of the thumb and the fourth ray, and these are the individual elements of those bones. When adjusted for overall body size, Artie's hand proportions cluster it over here with gorillas, humans, Australopithecus, and proconsul, and away from the highly suspensory elongated digits that we see and hands that we see in suspensory apes. However, the thumb of Artie is quite short relative to the fourth digit, pretty much ruling out the pad-to-pad -pad precision grip characteristic of humans and probably a sediba. Now, no presentation would be complete without a comment on phalangeal curvature, at least one from Stony Brook. Artie's proximal and middle phalanges are very curved, more so than a chimpanzee. Curved phalanges are biomechanically linked to arboreality, even when controlling for phylogeny. When estimated as the included angle seen here, the curvature of Artie's proximal phalanges plotted here in this plot exceeds that of chimpanzees and bonobos and approaches that seen in some sea among and spider monkeys. This is a powerful arboreal hand. If I had found only, if I were only of these elements alone, I might even think it is a suspensory hand. Now this is just a teaser, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly just to show you that 3D geodium is also useful for looking at some of these small, complicated bones of, of the wrist. This is the hamate of a chimpanzee. 
It's also possible to impose a phylogeny onto this and to examine shape space and phylogeny simultaneously. And you can see we're getting a good separation of lesser apes, great apes and humans, and all monkeys. I think this is a very, very promising methodology. And in fact, we just published a paper recently on Aurora and one of the other candidates that indicates using this methodology, in this case on the proximal femur, that the femur of Warren tuganensis exhibits morphometric affinities with both Miocene apes, like proconsul in particular, and later hominines. And by putting on the phylogeny, we can see this is one of the cases where the extant great apes are highly derived. Their shape has moved far away from what you expect in the last common ancestor. And this is one of the approaches we'll be taking in looking at other elements. So some conclusions. Artipithecus probably was a biped, almost certainly was a biped, when on the ground and perhaps in the trees. If the ancestral condition was pronograde, that pronograde signal is relatively weak, almost extinguished, I think. I think Artipithecus was a versatile arborealist and capable of climbing with, uh, and climber with grasping hands and feet, but was not a suspensory specialist. I think they, Artipithecus and chimpanzee solved the arboreal terrestrial challenge in very different ways. And the Artipithecus is probably a bona fide basal hominid and related somehow to the Australopith homo lineages. And finally, and more as a memo to myself, it's not a bad idea to have a look at the fossils before making proclamations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bill. We appreciate your coming here and sharing your expertise and your knowledge and your new understanding and especially your crow eating. Uh, with uh, everybody here in, at BU and everybody out there on the web. And in the midst of this, this, this harmony of sweet concord that we're, we're now hearing from, from previously uh, somewhat uh, um, opposed viewpoints, um, I guess it falls to me to inject a note of, of uh, discord into the proceedings uh, by raising some questions about other aspects of the of the synthetic view of Artipithecus that has uh, that emerged in the 2009 papers and that has become more and more uh, widely accepted among people like yourselves. Uh, because I have some problems with some of this, and let me just begin by saying that people who um, are not accustomed to thinking in evolutionary terms uh, and haven't had a lot of training in comparative anatomy often look at presentations like the two that we've just had and say to, our, say to themselves, oh, wait a minute, that's clearly the head of an ape. It's got a little tiny brain and a big protruding face. And how come the, you know, a few little features like the exact position of the carotid artery canals or that little wear facet on the back of the upper canine outweigh this obviously ape-like gestalt of the head? And similarly, when you look at the, at the artipithecus foot, yeah, okay, so it's got some, some features, uh, that little bump at the top of the, of the distal ends of the metatarsals. But look at the thing, it's got long toes, it's got curved phalanges, and most importantly, it's got a big thumb-like opposed first toe that's, that's tremendously primate. Like, how can you possibly decide that this thing is related to a human being when it doesn't resemble human beings? And the answer is, is pretty simple, that not all resemblances count. The ones that don't count are the ones that are primitive, that you have reason to believe that were inherited from an, some ancestor way back in the past, before the last common ancestor of the two animals or the three animals that you're trying to look at. Okay, for example, if we look at uh, human beings and opossums and hippopotamuses, uh, the fact that human beings and, and opossums have hair all over their bodies and, and hippopotamuses don't is not a reason for suspecting that people are more closely related to possums than they are to hippos. Okay, because it's a primitive feature. Primitive mammals had hair, and therefore you expect mammals to have hair. When they don't, it's what's called a derived feature or a synapomorphy. And it's only those non-primitive shared features that are reasonably interpreted as being a signal of evolutionary relationship, of close phylogenetic affinities. And with that in mind, I'd like to turn to another aspect of the Artipithecus story that I continue to have a lot of trouble with. Okay. The, one of the main reasons for the, the sort of turnover in opinion about what human ancestors looked like in the mid 20th century was the accumulation of an enormous amount of, of comparative anatomical evidence uh, 
uh, beginning with publications by Sir Arthur Keith back in the, in the 1920s, that human beings and all of the extant apes, the great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, uh, orangutans, and, and the lesser apes, the gibbons, all shared with human beings a large number of anatomical features that could be reasonably interpreted as having originated as adaptations to moving around in the trees in a suspensory position, hanging by your upper limbs. Okay, and I, I just want to run through um, a few of these uh, features. I'm not going to actually talk about them. I just, I'm just going to put up a, a list here so you can be impressed by the number of lines in the typography. <clears throat> okay, uh, there are a lot of things about the human postcranial skeleton, about all sorts of aspects of it, the pelvis, the shoulder girdle, uh, the, the bones of the arms and legs and feet, about the soft anatomy uh, in the, the viscera uh, that tell us that we have reason for suspecting that the last common ancestor of all the apes shared these non-primitive, non, they're not found in primitive primates, these, these derived features that originated as adaptations for arm swinging, for upright, orthograde uh, locomotor postures and for suspensory adaptations in the forelimb. Features associated with supporting the body weight through the forelimb uh, under, under overall tension in the limb. Uh, uh, traits associated with increasing the reach and mobility and power of the forelimb in propelling and suspending and turning the body. Uh, features associated with the reduction of, of adaptations for quadrupedal running and leaping like the the reduction of the, of the deep back muscles and the shortening of the vertebral column between the pelvis and the rib cage. And visceral traits associated with, with this 90 degree shift in, in the gravity vector from running at right angles to the spine to running parallel to the spine so that our guts tend to fall out at the bottom through our pelvic opening and we have adaptations to prevent that sort of thing from happening. We shared all of these adaptations with the living apes and they're not seen in any quadrupedal monkeys. And given that fact, it's hard for me at least to be entirely persuaded that these things originated again and again and again in many, many different lines of animals living, leading to the living great apes and humans uh, and the lesser apes which is required if, as the discoverers and describers of Artipithecus insist, the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees was an above-branch quadruped that had no suspensory adaptations and didn't hang by its upper limbs. Okay, so I'd like to throw that particular dead fish out on the table here in, in, in the middle of the ice cream party and uh, ask our distinguished visitors um, how they would respond to that kind of critique. You, you raise, I think, a, a variety of, of very good points, Matt. Um, I think one of, the, one of the problems is that if we go to the fossil record, uh, it doesn't speak very clearly to when those events happened. Uh, and some of the events uh, in your list uh, are not clearly linked to suspensory behavior at all, like loss of the tail. Uh, but you may have noticed that I sort of avoided talking very much about what the last common ancestor of chimps uh, and uh, Artipithecus and early hominins looked like, of whether how Artipithecus uh, might fit into that, that profile. Uh, I know that the an last common ancestor has been characterized as a pronograde animal and I think modeled in large part on uh, the Miocene apes, earlier Miocene apes uh, of Africa. Uh, and it's true, with the rare exception of maybe Oreopithecus, uh, none of those really show orthograde anatomies. So I'm not disputing the possibility that m there was more suspension involved than maybe has been characterized in the pages of science. I think that it's probably the case that with a hand and a body design like Artipithecus, that it was capable of almost any kind of arboreal behavior except pronograde activities. <laughs> the only thing I would, I would add to that, and I, and I do agree with the idea that the fossil record is the ultimate arbiter of the chronology of acquisition of these characteristics. The con very thorough list you showed, Matt, is based on comparison of living African apes with, with, with humans. Uh, 
But the other thing is, is that the extent of convergent evolution or homoplasy here is, is, is and it's important for the audience to understand this, is, is not dependent on Artipithecus being uniquely related to Australopithecus and Homo. That list is more or less the same if it is more closely related to chimps than to humans or to gorillas than to chimps and humans. Many of those characteristics remain convergent uh, if indeed Artipithecus represents the primitive bow plan for the body uh, that was ancestral to, to all hominoids. So. Okay. Um, we've had some questions sent in uh, over the internet and uh, by email. Uh, we have time, I think, to ask a couple of them. Uh, let me begin by asking a, a question um, about the, the foot skeleton from Bertelli that Bill Junger showed us. Uh, this is coming from about 3.5 million years ago. Right. And up until the discovery of that foot, there was a pretty general consensus that most of the, at least, Ethiopian material from that time range, and there isn't a lot of other material from that time range, um, could be put into a single species, namely uh, Australopithecus afarensis. And now we seem to have pretty good evidence that there were at least two animals present in that melange of material that we're calling Australopithecus afarensis, the, the, the Lucy species that has been thought to go with the Lucy skeleton, um, one of which had a, a, a grasping opposable big toe and the other one didn't. Okay, so. Uh, I've got a question here sent in by Bernard Wood down at GWU who wants to know um, how you go about doing the alpha taxonomy in this uh, 3.5 million year old uh, collection of East African fossils and whether there is evidence for thinking that any one region, teeth or cranial vault or upper or lower limbs, shows more or less evidence of of um, morphological discontinuity, of homoplasy, or is likely to be a, a more reliable source of hypotheses about what's related to what and what belongs in which species. Well, I, I, I think the, the Bertelli foot certainly tells us that there was more than one lineage at uh, three and a half million years ago. That's, that's quite clear. Um, the dilemma with regard to, to alpha taxonomy, of course, is that Almost all of our diagnostic characteristics from, come from the uh, skull and dentition. So the key to unraveling the alpha taxonomy in this time period will be to find another Lucy skeleton, for example, in which you have a foot like the Bertelli foot with, with diagnostic craniodental material. Having said that, however, of course, there's a long history of interpretation of the Hadar remains in particular. Um, that has a minority but very important position that has suggested, in fact, that the Hadar sample itself consists of two taxa, one of which typified by Lucy and another which typified by the 333 or first family material. So, <clears throat> you know, it is a viable, more viable alternative than it was before the foot. The question is how do we operationalize the, uh, 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 from here on out, and I don't grant any particular part of the anatomy primacy with respect to phylogenetic value or homoplasy, frankly, because homoplasy to me in phylogenetic reconstruction is not a tool for analysis. It's an outcome of analysis. Mm -hmm. So the question is, which heap of purported uh, synapomorphies is the biggest heap? Well, clearly right now it's, it's, it's it, from the, well, synapomorphies we're not dealing with at the alpha taxonomic level. We're dealing merely with phonetic differences. And yeah, right now, they're, they're, mostly, they're mostly craniodental, of course. And, and, and to the credit of the people who described the Bertelli foot, they made no claims as to what species it belonged with. It was only diagnosed as a hominy uh, based on that one and I think rather powerful complex of doming and canting. Uh, so I think they've left the door open as to what that might ultimately belong to. There are a lot of interesting questions to be asked here. We hope that you will come and help us ask them and uh, maybe listen to some of the answers that you get from, from our distinguished guests and other members of our uh, roundtable panel uh, this afternoon at 4.30 here on the fourth floor of Hillel House at, on the uh, BU Charles River campus. Uh, we'll be having an open uh, public panel discussion featuring uh, professors Kimball and Jungers and some of the BU faculty uh, asking and answering uh, 
pointed questions about Artipithecus and its meaning and how it fits into our understanding of human evolution. So please come along, uh, bring your questions, uh, listen to some of the other questions that we've got to ask here and that I know all of the participants will want to direct to each other and join us afterwards for uh, a reception and for a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one up close uh, to the participants in this eighth iteration of the BU Dialogues in Biological Anthropology.